Good day and welcome everybody. It is my privilege um, to welcome you to this webinar on invertebrate sentience uh, brought to you by Wellbeing International and sponsored by the Center for Effective Altruism. I would first like to start off by thanking uh, the team that's making this possible. Um, Alora, our academic and technical group, Alora, Anne-Sophie, Catherine, Chiara, and Nicola. Um, thank you very much for being here and for, do, for all you've done to make this a success. Um, I'm hoping that everything's going to run really smoothly uh, today. Then I would like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Stephen Harnad, who has had a distinguished career, and I've known him for many years, uh, in cognitive science and in pushing for open access to academic materials. Stephen, uh, thank you very much for everything you're doing for Animal Sentience, the journal, and for this webinar. It's over to you. Thank you, Andrew. And since you have been so rigorous about the time constraints, I'm going to be rigorous myself. Uh, and I, as I, I've, I've, I've also been rather rigorous with the, with the speakers, I'm going to be speaking very briefly now to introduce uh, the topic. And then I'll hand it directly to Jonathan Birch. Welcome to this first of two webinars on invertebrate sentience. We have two very full programs with distinguished experts on many aspects of this topic. And we have also have an audience of up to a thousand, uh, as I hear, on Zoom, plus who knows how many more in the live stream on YouTube. I know from the Zoom list in front of me that, that there are many researchers out there from many fields from all over the world, some of whom are just as expert as our seven speakers. So I'd like to encourage the audience to make use of the time we've observed, uh, reserved for comments, questions, and interaction. Four animal sentience interns behind the scenes here in Montreal uh, are working to keep track of your comments and questions and passing them on to me so I can transmit them to the speakers. Of course, there's no hope of airing them all or even most, but the chances are much better if you make them short and clear. And questions don't need to be just from experts since there's obviously a very wide and growing public interest in this topic. What is the topic? What is sentience? Sentience is a state a state that it feels like something to be in. What you're feeling can be sensations like touch, color, sound, warmth, or movement, or it can be emotions like joy or fear. To feel any of these or feel anything else is to be in a felt state, a state that's felt. You're sentient when you're awake, so not in deep sleep or under general anesthesia, and sentience, uh, but sentience is indeed a state, but most states are not sentient. Water boiling is in a state, but not in a sentient state. It does not feel like anything to be water boiling or a planet revolving around the sun or a car's engine revving. But besides being a state that an entity can be in, sentience is also a trait that an entity can have. Some kinds of living things can have sentient states sometimes. Others can't, ever. Although there are some researchers who think that all living things are sentient. Uh, I'm not sure whether they mean that they're sentient all the time or that ever. One day we may have a webinar on whether plants are sentient. And another day we may ask whether robots can be sentient. But right now, the pressing question is whether invertebrates are sentient. Can they feel anything? The answer matters, at the very least to them, if, if they can feel. For where there is feeling, there can be hurt. You can damage a car or a computer, but until further notice, you can only hurt a sentient organism. And judging from the size of this webinar, it doesn't matter only to the sentient organism if it can be hurt and it can, can be or is hurt. It matters to many of us too, because that seems to be part of our, our kind of sentience. The human species is sentient. It can be and has been colossally, unbelievably cruel. 
but it can also be compassionate and curious. Which organisms are sentient? Strictly speaking, the only organism that anyone can be absolutely sure is sentient is oneself. The only one whose feelings I can feel is me. About others, I can't be sure because I cannot feel their feelings. This is called the other minds problem. And there's no sure solution, even about any other member of our own species. We can't know for sure that other people feel. But with our own species, evolution has given us mind reading abilities. We know how to make movements and sounds, and we can perceive when others are making those same movements or sounds. That's why we can imitate them. We also know what it feels like to feel happy or sad or angry or afraid or hurt. And we can tell when others are feeling the same thing. We can tell from their movements and the sounds they make, among other things. It's fashionable these days to explain this kind of mind reading capacity with mirror neurons. Fire, neurons that fire in our brains when we, do, when we do something or when someone else does the very same thing. But we already knew we could do that, even before the discovery of mirror neurons, because we can imitate. And there's evidence that other primates and other mammals and birds can imitate too, to varying degrees. With a little familiarity, we can come to see that many other vertebrates, reptiles, amphibians, fish, can mind, mind read to some degree too, and not just one another. Mind reading works across species too. Whenever you have to deal with another organism, socially or by a predation and prey. So very few people are in doubt about whether vertebrates, vertebrates are sentient. Vertebrates turned out to be more and more like us because most of them look and act so much like us. Sometimes that's what's called anthropomorphism, projecting our own sentient states onto them. But more and more often it turns out to be true. Our mind reading capacity isn't leading us astray with vertebrates. It's actually perceiving sentience in others, others that are sometimes very different from ourselves or so we had thought. But we're not just relying intuitively on our mirror neurons to perceive what other species feel. We also have evidence objective, observable, empirical. Some feel they need to keep obsessively calling it scientific evidence. Evidence of the surprising and surprisingly familiar and surprisingly understandable things that other species are turning out to be able to do and to learn to do, not just with circus training, but on their own, in their own worlds, or what scientists like to call their own ecological niches. Doing is not feeling. Robots can do things too, including learning to do things. And the other mind's problem is always there in the background, ready to sow doubts about feeling. For every overzealous mind reader who overreaches and declares that every living organism feels, or even the panpsychists who think that every atom and every molecule in the universe feels, there are also the overzealous doubters who are not sure that even people feel. We're here today to examine the point where the other mind's problem really begins, and it's not with other people. And whoever denies that it hurts a dog to be kicked or a duck to be plucked is rightly seen by most of us as a psychopath. But when it comes to bugs and slugs, so unlike us, without those familiar movements and vocalizations and facial expressions, or even faces, it, it's there that our mirror neurons, the, 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 uh, sorry, I said that wrong. Uh, without all of those familiar movements that our neuro, mirror neurons know so well, we aren't so sure. I will now introduce our first speaker, Jonathan Birch, a philosopher and bioethicist who is well known for his work in applying the precautionary principle to the legal protection of invertebrates, or at least some of them, as sentient species. I will leave it to Jonathan to explain the precautionary principle to you, but let me close by posing again a question that I've already raised a couple of times here a, a few minutes ago, a question for all of us to reflect on. Whose problem 
is the other mind's problem? Is it really our problem, the human theorists contemplating it, the curious scientists busily testing our hypotheses on our target species, probing whether or not they feel? Or is the other mind's problem really the problem of those other minds, of each individual member of those target species? If our hypothesis is that they, they, that they do not feel, but in fact, they do. Jonathan Birch. Thanks very much, Stephen. Uh, thanks very much to all the organizers of this event and thanks to everyone who's attending. I'm going to share a screen now. Um, and if you want to see any of these slides again, if they rush a little bit quickly past as I speak, there's a link at the bottom, bit.ly slash Birch WBI with WBI in capital letters that will allow you to view the slides in a web browser. People don't always agree about the definition of sentience. Here's a definition that I find helpful. I think of sentience as the capacity to have feelings with a positive or negative quality, such as feelings of pain, pleasure, comfort, discomfort, boredom, excitement, contentment, frustration, anxiety, joy. A few comments on that definition that sentience is not just about pain and pleasure. And I think everyone can agree about that. That would be too narrow a way of thinking about it. And it's about having feelings. It's not about more sophisticated things like reflecting on your feelings in the way that we often do, let alone understanding the feelings of others. An animal need not be able to reflect on its own feelings or understand the feelings of others to have them. A sentient animal doesn't need to have any of those specific human feelings that I listed a moment ago. That list helps us get a grip on what I'm talking about when I talk about feelings. It helps us get some grip on the general category, but we don't need to assume that our human categories apply to the feelings of other animals. That may not be the case. And I think the urge to define feeling in some other terms should be resisted, particularly in terms of species specific mechanisms. We have to be open to the possibility that there may be systems that have feelings, but that are organized in a very different way from the human brain with substantially different mechanisms. Why does sentience matter? To put it in jo Jeremy Bentham's phrase, the question is not can they talk nor can they reason, but can they suffer? That's a rather poetic way of putting it. To put it more bluntly, there's nothing wrong with boiling a vegetable, assuming vegetables to be non-sentient, but there is something wrong with boiling a sentient being. One might add the qualification without a very good reason. Some people would certainly want to add that qualification, but I hope we can all agree that you would need a very good reason to justify boiling a sentient being. But sentience also matters legally. It matters to the scope of animal welfare law in an increasing number of countries, in the UK, in the European Union, Switzerland, Norway, Australia, Canada, New Zealand. Increasingly, policymakers are starting to think, if we want to get the scope of animal welfare protection right, we need to set it at the outer limit of those animals that are sentient. But that's an extremely hard thing to do. The UK context, I think, is, is quite important at the moment and certainly particularly important to me because there's this sentient bill that is being debated right now that in its current form um, enshrines respect for the sentience of vertebrate animals in law. There's some suggestion that policymakers might be open to the possibility of extending it to some invertebrates. That's become a huge topic of debate in the UK and it's an important issue. Sentience also matters to the rest of UK animal welfare law as well, including the Animal Welfare Act, the Animal Scientific Procedures Act that re regulates the use of animals in science and regulations like the welfare of animals at the time of killing regulations. In all of these cases, animal welfare law aims to prevent feelings of suffering and pain, to prevent welfare risks. And the concept of sentience has become very important as a result means we're facing this question of, well, should we be protecting just vertebrates? Or should we be extending the scope of animal welfare law 
to invertebrates too. We very quickly run into a very difficult question, which is the question of which invertebrates are sentient. If one tries to protect all invertebrates, well, that's uh, the vast majority of all the animals on earth, including many microscopic ones. But if one tries to protect just some invertebrates, which is it gonna be? And everyone has their difficult cases here. Historically, cephalopod mollusks like octopuses, cuttlefish pictured here have been thought of as difficult cases by many people. Crabs, insects, you may not be thinking they're difficult cases. You may, you may be thinking, of course, cephalopods are sentient. I've seen my octopus teacher on Netflix, of course, but even for you, there'll be some difficult cases. You might still wonder, about horseshoe crabs, for example, that are incredibly uh, important to vaccine manufacture. You might wonder about jellyfish. You might wonder about nematodes, like the nematode words worm C. elegans, an incredibly important model organism in science. Everyone has their line somewhere where they start wondering and where these cases start to get really difficult. Which invertebrates should fall within the scope of animal welfare protections? If you say all, then you know, even the microscopic ones, even the dust mites, the tardigrades, the zooplankton, the krill, huge class of animals there that we have no idea how to protect and that we have no relevant evidence about or little relevant evidence. But none, well, are you really going to even exclude even the notoriously intelligent octopus? Seems like a more sensible approach would be to protect some. What we need, I think, is to have clear, fair criteria for inclusion, criteria that do not set the bar so high an invertebrate could never meet it, and that implies a double standard in the way we treat invertebrates versus how we treat vertebrates. A set of clear and fair criteria for inclusion that will allow us to let the evidence guide us in formulating animal welfare policy. So what sort of criteria and evidence do we need to look at in this area? Well, we can't simply ask animals uh, how they feel. What we can do is draw on a battery of quite different criteria from neuroscience, from cognitive science, from observing animal behavior, and put together a case based on those kinds of criteria. We can look, for example, at neurobiology and ask, for example, are there integrative brain regions in the animal that are dedicated to learning and memory and that bring together information from lots of different sources? We can look at cognitive and behavioral criteria like, for example, does the animal show flexible self-protective behavior that's under centralized control and that is not a mere reflex of the type you might have when you touch a hot stove and your hand withdraws. That's entirely a peripheral reflex, but we can ask if there's flexible self-protective behavior under centralized control in response to threat or injury. We can ask, does the animal learn new strategies to avoid injury and threat? Again, it's about looking for responses that go beyond mere reflexes and show that there is learning from experience. And there are some criteria that are a mixture and that have behavioral and neurological elements. We can ask, for example, are there responses to injury that are stopped when we apply an analgesic, a painkiller, or a local anesthetic? The challenge there is to find out what the right analgesics and local anesthetics are. The fact that an invertebrate may not respond to a compound that would be an analgesic for us, like morphine, doesn't tell us it's not sentient. But if we can find compounds that they do respond to and that do seem to act as analgesics or anesthetics for them, that's relevant evidence. Now, how should we think then about all of these criteria? I don't think we can see any of them as a smoking gun, as it were, a criterion that is sufficient by itself. Do that you know, and you're definitely sentient. Of course, it doesn't really work like that. Equally, I don't think any criterion is a sine qua non, something that's necessary by itself. If you don't have this, you can't be sentient. We're not in a position to make claims like that. What we need to do is think of these criteria as warning signs or risk factors, if you prefer, or symptoms. Think of them like that, and you can see that no one by itself is decisive, but that the case for sentience builds up as more of them are found. And that's certainly the situation we're in 
with respect to some invertebrates. I'll just give you one example of a particularly compelling piece of evidence from a recent paper by Robin Crook. What Crook is asking in this paper is about octopuses. And she asks, will octopuses learn to avoid a location in which they've experienced a noxious stimulus, acetic acid, which they really hate? Will they learn to avoid the place where that was administered and learn to prefer a chamber in which they were able to access local anesthetic and the local anesthetic being used was lidocaine after receiving that noxious stimulus. And Crook found yes, perhaps unsurprisingly, octopuses do learn that conditioned place preference. When they've received a noxious stimulus, they will avoid the place they received it. When they get the local anesthetic, they will develop a lasting preference for that place. A pattern of behavior that is very plausibly explained by the octopus having this aversive experience, this feeling that is then attenuated by applying the local anesthetic. And the neurological evidence seems to point the same way in that Crook measured the nervous system response when the acetic acid was removed and found very strong signals from the arms to the central brain. And then when the local anesthetic was applied, those signals were dampened right down to a more normal pattern of activity. There's a link there in the slides if you want to read that paper. It's an open access paper. That's just one example of the type of evidence we can use to start to put together a case for thinking there's risk factors here, there's symptoms here. There's a risk of sentience that we need to take seriously. In relation to that sentience bill, the UK Parliament has been considering the evidence. I did a session with the uh, EFRA Select Committee in July. Again, if you go to the slides, you can click the link and watch that session if you want or read the transcript. Where, I mean, here's a quick summary of what I was saying to them, two policymakers in the UK. And I'd say the same message to any policymaker anywhere in the world, that the evidence of sentience along the lines I've just been discussing is very strong for octopuses, but it's also substantial for other cephalopod mollusks like squid and cuttlefish and some decapod crustaceans like crabs, lobsters, crayfish. You'll hear more about that evidence in Bob Elwood's tour. In the UK, we have a very strange inconsistency in the current law where cephalopod mollusks are protected in science because of this type of evidence and the risk it implies. But as soon as you're outside of a scientific setting, they're no longer protected. That's very strange indeed, and there's no justification for it. But moreover, one can say that the welfare risks posed by current practices involving these animals, and in particular, when one thinks of some of the preparation methods that are used, particularly by untrained people on crabs and lobsters, such as dropping them in boiling water, are extremely severe. The welfare risks they pose are very clear and very problematic. And it would be proportionate to introduce welfare protections for these animals, as some countries already do. And I'd add that I don't think the, the shellfish industry has anything to fear from such regulation. Producers that already apply high welfare standards have a chance to see their high standards enforced. It's about leveling up, so to speak, so that the standards of the best producers are rolled out to the entire country. So I'll stop there. I think there's much more to talk about, which we'll hear about in the subsequent talks, but thanks very much for your attention. And a reminder, bit.ly slash Birch WBI, if you want to see these slides. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for being so faithful to the deadline. Uh, it's open to questions there, uh, and uh, panelists can ask them directly by, by uh, raising their hands and I can recognize you. Uh, while I'm waiting for that, I see there's, uh, while I'm waiting for that, I don't want to waste your, uh, your private discussion session with, with the blank. So let me ask you, you emphasized and rightly that um, even starting with the Bentham quote, what matters is, is uh, whether animals can feel and suffer and not how smart they are. But when you define sentience, you, you insisted and, uh, the, and you said that there were positive and negative uh, emotions like pain and pleasure, but you insisted that it was either one or the other uh, or both that mattered. And you didn't say anything about uh, neutral sensations. Do you not consider sensations to be sentient? 
yes, one can define sentience in a broader sense that includes neutral sensations as well, as such as experiences of colour and odour and sound. Absolutely. And that's an incredibly important thing to study too. Nonetheless, policymakers in formulating laws and so on often emphasise valenced experiences and they often emphasise the negative. They emphasise pain and suffering. And I can see the rationale for doing that in that it draws our attention to the most serious welfare risks. So there's, there's costs and benefits to doing that. Thank you. Now we do have a, a question from Marais Holden. Keeping animals act captive, experimenting on them, and perhaps even introducing painful stimuli in order to determine their level of sentience, as in Crook's octopus study, seems to be quite ethically questionable. What changes need to happen within the scientific community to allow us to study animal sentience without harming animals? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. I think Robin Crook's experiment is, is extremely valuable for the reasons that I explain, but you're right, it does involve applying a noxious stimulus, as many experiments in this area do. I think it is really important to try to find better ways of studying sentience without causing pain. Uh, part of my Foundations of Animal Sentience project is, is about that. We, we have various experiments running in, in bees, some of them in collab collaboration with Lars, who you hear from later. An important aspect of experimental design for me in doing this work is to try and find ways of studying sentience without causing extreme aversive experiences. That There are challenges and compromises and, and trade-offs, but I agree it's an important priority. Uh, there's another question about whether uh, it, it's not specified. By the way, please specify if you want to be anonymous in your questions, because otherwise I tend to say the name. Are there policies like what you're describing or analogous in the United States to protect invertebrates? Well, not to my knowledge. The United States is, is a complicated patchwork of state level and federal level law. Animal welfare law at the federal level is very poor indeed and protects very limited number of animals. And I've not heard of any real progress in the direction of, of expanding the scope. So I'd love to see it, but I've not seen many positive signs recently. Okay. Uh, Amelie Espinosa asked, can, can we consider sedation as a marker of sentience? I think sedation by itself is not really enough, um, but it could be part of a, of a broader experimental strategy. I think what is really compelling is the sort of experiment I've described where you have this potential painkiller analgesic anesthetic, and you see that it modifies the animal's response to injury or threat. So it's not simply a case of the animal being sedated, but its response is being modified in a way that seems to suggest that it's the negative experience that has been abolished by this drug. Wayne Mackay asks the, about the distinction that we all know about pulling the hand back from the hot stove. Uh, would that not be illustrating a sentient pain reaction? In other words, why would we distinguish that as not sentience? Yeah, I think we'll, we'll hear more about the distinction between reflex and centralized responses in, in Bob's talk. But it is important that you know, that reflex response when you pull your hand away has a pathway that doesn't run through the conscious experience of pain at all. The conscious experience of pain, you know, that happens somewhat later, that, that withdrawal reflex is already underway by the time the conscious experience of pain happens. So we have to be a bit more sophisticated in looking for what it is that the conscious experience of pain does. And I think we will hear more about that from Bob. Okay, we're soon going to know, go on to some other questions, but there's a few more now. Uh, Munir Bukhadum asks, I really don't see why the given criteria or evidence do not apply to vegetables as well. A nervous system, is a nervous system necessary for intelligent behavior? Point is to have fair criteria for inclusion that are rigorous and serious. If we have such criteria along the lines that I've set out and you want to make a case for any plant meeting those criteria, I'm absolutely open to listening to the case. I currently think there is no positive evidence at the required level uh, at all for plants. 
Last question. Instead of aversion testing, which hurts, why not emphasize preference testing or reward acquisition so positive valence is in, uh, investigated and not just negative? Yeah, I agree that research on positive experiences is, is very important here. One challenge is potentially to distinguish um, sort of addiction from, from the phenomenon you actually want to discover. Uh, but nonetheless, yes, I mean, using reward rather than punishment is a very important line of research. Jonathan, thank you ever so much. We'll be hearing mu much more from Jonathan later on in the general discussion, and he'll be there next week as well. But now I turn with very little ceremony to Bob Elwood, who is actually doing the experiments that we're uh, discussing and reviewing them in many, um, in many species, not just invertebrates. Bob. It's yours. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, I'm going to talk today about a specific group of decapods and try and look at sentience in a broader sense. And the group I'm going to look at are hermit crabs and their relationship with shells and to see what that tells us about sentience. Hermit crabs are those animals that inhabit gastropod shells, and they select particular shells on the basis of size, shape, weight, color, and the presence of epibionts. Now, these are very different attributes, and they are traded off against each other. So a shell that's the wrong size um, might be preferred over one that's the wrong shape, but as you alter the shape and size variables, the preference may switch from species to species. But how do crabs gather information? How do they compare shells? And how do they decide which one to occupy? And what does that tell us about sentience? Well, hermit crabs perceive a, a shell from a distance, and they do that by their visual modality. They can detect uh, color differences in shells. They can detect set shape differences, differences between species and they can get aspects of size. The, the animal then grabs the uh, exterior of the shell. It fills over the shell with its pads, these claws called chilipeds, and it also grips the shells with the walking legs in, in a caniper-like um, position, and, and, and they are gathering information from the exterior of the shell. You can show that experimentally. They uh, begin to turn the shell all the time, running their walking legs over the, uh, over the exterior of the shell. They then access the aperture and they place their pads into the aperture and, and move the pads around. And sometimes they put walking legs in as well. Now in experiments on a different species, uh, they showed that the minor pad, which in this species was the right claw, the minor chiliped is waved backwards and forwards and measures the diameter of the aperture. By contrast, the major chiliped is used primarily by probing in and measuring the depth. So these chilipeds are used in different ways to assess different aspects of, of information about the shell quality. The crab may then, or may not, but it may uh, release its grip on the uh, original shell and move deftly into this new shell. And that's not the end of the, uh, the, the process because now it continues the assessment of the new shell. We see three distinctive behaviors. First, the animal will withdraw rapidly and repeatedly into the shell, a sort of a snap withdrawal, which would be a good means of assessing the size and the shape of the interior. They use the walking legs again to run over the exterior of the shell. This time they move uh, backwards rather than forward. So it's a different movement, but they still seem to be getting information about the shell whilst in it using this activity. And they show this extraordinary activity of standing on their chili pads and walking legs and twirling 
the new shell up in the water column. And this would undoubtedly be an excellent way of assessing the weight of that shell. Weight is very important because the crab has to expend energy carrying this shell. Now, sometimes you see the crab switching its attention back to its original shell and it starts moving its chili pet, it starts going through the activities that we've seen before, but now with the shell it had uh, moved out of and it inspects the exterior, it inspects the interior, and indeed in some cases you may see the animal move from the new shell back into the original shell. And we see then more interaction sometimes with the new shell, and indeed, in this case, uh, the, the crab finally moved back into the new shell and walked away in this new shell. The thing I'd like you to note in this, uh, this scheme of, of um, transitions between activities is that any point in the assessment, the animal may stop the assessment and abandon the shell and leave the, the, the vicinity. And the larger the potential gain, uh, in shell quality, the quicker it decides to take the new shell. It's more likely to move forward and take the new shell, and it does so quickly. However, the poorer the offered shell, the quicker it decides to quit. It integrates information gathered by different sensory modalities, gathered at different times, and the crab draws on memories of previously gathered information. And importantly, because it's switching from one shell to the other, gathering information about both, sometimes when outside the shell, sometimes when inside the shell, it must keep track of which information relates to which shell. Now that's not the end of the situation because there's a series of experiments have shown other factors will alter well, the shell preference. For example, the odor of particular predators will affect the shell choice of the hermit crab. Uh, one predator in this experiment is a shell peeler, and these animals find it difficult to peel uh, thicker walled shells. And if the crab is exposed to the odor of this, crab, this um, predator, it takes a larger, thicker walled shell here. By contrast, if it exposed to this predator, this is a crushing predator, it doesn't matter how big the shed is, this predator can crush it. So the optimum uh, strategy here is to take a smaller, lighter, thinner walled shell, which enables the hermit crab to run away quickly. So there's a, a dis discrimination between odors, and then that alters the shell choice. We have uh, a situation in, in the natural situation, there are lo lots of obstacles to navigate and hermit crabs seem to be aware of the size of those obstacles and gaps between them. And that can alter their choice of shell. Here we have an experiment using artificial shells. These were artificially printed, 3D printing. And uh, this is just one example of the, of the experiment where the crab was offered two shells. One has spines on the outside, one had spines on the inside, and they really do not like these shells with spines on the inside. Now in the control condition, uh, there was a hole in, in the arena in which they, they, they were kept, and there were crabs outside. The, these are social animals, and they like to get out and meet with the other crabs. Uh, if that aperture here was big enough for either of those shells to pass through, then they took very, very few of these inner ones with the inner spines. Virtually zero took these. They took these very strong preference. But if the aperture allowing escape was much smaller, such that the ones with spines could not pass through, then they took the, the one that was initially highly avoided, they took these ones with the inner spines and moved through the aperture and, and became social with the other crabs. So they could at least perceive the size of that gap. 
we see a phenomenon of vacancy chains and and here you might find in these terrestrial species that uh, a crab might encounter a large shell, one that's too large for it, too large, uh, too heavy, uh, it, it couldn't possibly uh, cope in, in a shell that size. Rather than simply rejecting it in this case, the crab may choose to stay in the vicinity and uh, another crab may come along and the shell may be too large for it, uh, but it too will stay in the vicinity. And it seems you get these aggregations of crabs around a large empty shell. Uh, and and it's these, these aggregations seem to be attracted to other crabs. So you get more and more joining until a very large crab comes along in a shell that's a bit too small for it. And it may take the very large shell that's available and discard its, its old shell. And the crabs then line up in size order. And as each shell is discarded, it passes down the chain of crabs and, and, and so, so all the crabs involved gets some improved uh, improvement and, and the very smallest just discards its shell. So this, this requires a, a, a high degree of cognitive processing, I, I suggest, and, and possibly some awareness. Uh, but crabs also remember other crabs and they remember their shells. And in this experiment, crabs were exposed to two other crabs. Then they were given a shell that had the aperture blocked so that they couldn't occupy that shell, but they didn't know that until they started investigating. Plus, they were offered the odor of one of the crabs. Now, if the odor of that crab had occupied a particularly good shell, then attempts to gain the offered stimulus shell were enhanced. We see here that the latency was much reduced if, if, if the odor of the crab in the good shell was present, uh, as opposed to if it was a crab in, in, in an ordinary shell. And they persisted with their attempts to remove the obstacle uh, if, if, if there was the odor of a crab in the good shell. Other tests showed that it was not the odor of the shell that was being detected, Rather, it was the odor of the crab was being associated with a particular shell, and that was altering the motivation to, to tackle this, uh, this new stimulus shell. In some of my own experiments, I've looked at uh, whether an electric shock provided a small electric shock within the shell has an effect on, on these crabs. And what it does is, is that it dramatically lowers the motivation to keep this shell. Uh, if, if you offer the crab uh, another shell, then those that have been shot within shells, uh, compared to those that were wired up but not shot, show a, a memory of the aversive event for at least 24 hours. They, they become very interested in, in new offered shells and move into them. But some crabs get out and we see a trade-off between avoiding the shock and keeping a quality shell. That is, they are more likely to get out of a poor quality shell than, than a good quality shell. We see fights for shells. These are much more cognitively complex. Uh, attackers monitor their own actions and, and they monitor the effects of the defender. And if, if, if they're not having the desired effect, then they will uh, alter their tactics uh, to accommodate that. And defenders trade off avoiding shell wrapping in these attacks. The attacker hits its shell repeatedly against that of the defender and, and, and it trades off the, the wrapping against the potential gain or loss of the shell in a very similar way that we showed with electric shocks. Well, what does this tell us about sentience? And here I've used Don Broom's uh, definition of sentience, he, he, he was suggesting that sentience uh, should show some ability to evaluate the actions of others in relation to itself and third parties, and I think we see that in vacancy chains. Remember some of its own actions and their consequences, we see that in assessing shells. Assessing risks and benefits, and we certainly see that in shell fights, and taking shells to protect from, from predators. 
that they should have some feelings. And uh, I think there are lots of data that are consistent with the idea of pain, both from uh, these animals, the hermit crabs, but also from a range of other decapods that we've studied in my lab and other labs, and that they should have some degree of awareness. And I incline to believe that choosing a shell specifically to escape from an enclosure shows some or suggests some degree of awareness. And I think I will stop at that point there and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thanks, um, Bob, for, for sticking to your time so well. Uh, there are a number of questions. Let me just uh, start with uh, some of the substantive ones. Um, in This is from Caitlin Crew. In Lynn McTaggart's book, The Intention Experiment, there was a reference to there being evidence that even plants respond differently to the intention of the experimenter. Namely, when the experimenter had the attention, well, had the intention to harm the plant. This is all old data. I'm, I'm not sure whether it, you, it, it's valid. This is Stephen speaking now. Plant registered a relative stress response, whereas if the experimenter merely pretended to inflict harm without the intention to execute, the stress response was absent. Have there been any similar studies that you know of on invertebrates studying instead the intention to harm rather than execution? I might add this experiment that's mentioned here is almost apocryphal, and it certainly hasn't been repeated. I, I, I can't really comment on plants. I, I, I will go along with Jonathan's answer on that, that I've, I have yet to be convinced that the that plants have the um, necessary mechanisms to uh, have feelings. Uh, I'm sure they can respond to things, they do respond, but to have an awareness about feelings um, I, I doubt that very much, but again, like Jonathan, I'd be open to, to, to viewing evidence when it, if and when it becomes available. Here's a question from Jared Edge. Will a crab return to move into a previously rejected shell if no better option is available? If so, is there any indication that they remember the previously rejected shell or could they be in, uh, encountering the shell anew and have lowered their standards? I. I Many years ago, we, we did experiments that showed that crabs, uh, once they've rejected a shell, will, will recognize that shell. Even, even if it, you move it to a different position, it, 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 it will remember that shell. Um, but crabs will take the best shell that's available. It's not just the perfect shell. Um, the, the crab really needs a shell. And to evacuate from a shell is, 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 is a sign of real desperation. And, and they're giving up a very, very valuable resource if they get out and abandon a shell altogether. But they, they, they do need a shell on, and they will take very poor shells if that's all that's available. And indeed, we've seen hermit crabs inhabiting bits of plastic, um, of plastic waste on beaches um, when, when they can't find a shell that betters that bit of plastic. Uh, here's a question from uh, Barb Whitman, but it's somewhat uh, incomplete. I'll try to fill, it, fill in what I think she intended to say. Does personality in individuals of a species, for example, lobsters, octopuses, and others with individuals' personalities, and then she says, in my over 50, 45 years of experience working with them, come into the equation of sentience at any point? So I think what she means is that she, in her experience, they have personalities, and she asks whether that should um, be considered in connection with sentience. Personality is, is to have repeatable differences in, 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 in behavior between individuals. And I think that is quite a natural thing. Um, and, and, and it's to be expected because there are physiological differences between individuals and this may affect how they respond. I'm not sure that I can tie that in specifically to sentence, Sim simply showing that the, we have these differences between individuals doesn't convince me that that's a criterion for, for sentience. Very good, we've had repeated, uh, that question about personality has been repeated uh, by several questioners. Do hermit crabs 
exhibit any sign of altruism? Do they respond to the distress of another hermit crab? Are there any invertebrates in general that demonstrate altruistic behavior? Notice that the hermit, hermit crabs and many other invertebrates, sorry, the, the question changed as oh, I was oh, okay. I, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, I don't know of any uh, signs of altruism. In fact, hermit crabs uh, will cannibalize uh, if, if they find a crab out of its shell, it's, it's lost contact with the shell. Uh, sometimes after a fight, uh, if, if there's lots of other crabs around, when one crab is evicted, it, it, it may be scared off and, and pushed away from the shell, and then it can, can be subject to cannibalism. Uh, and in, in such terrestrial crabs, we get vacancy chains forming around fights. Uh, crabs appear to predict that a fight will occur and gather around, almost like kids in a playground. And, and if a crab is evicted, then the other crabs rush in to take the winner's shell when it, when it discards that shell it, before the evicted crab can get to it. And you get this vacancy chain going down and it, it leaves the evicted crab with, with nothing it can really occupy it as this tiny, tiny shell that's left, and it may end up naked and die. We're running to, to the end of the questions, and there's lots of questions here that are overlapping between Jonathan and yourself, Bob. So I, they're going to come up in the, I'll, I'll ask them in the joint session. Um, okay. do the, here's a, 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 a developmental question. Do very young hermit crabs show the same behaviors when checking out shells? as older creatures, or do they appear to learn or gain new behaviors as they age? The, the evidence that we have is, is that in, in fights, the defending crab withdraws into its shell and appears not to be able to gather information during the fight itself about the opponent shell, about the attacker shell. But they, they would have had the opportunity to, to, to see it when, when the attacker approaches. And what we've shown is that very young crabs cannot assess the attacker's shell during that approach, but older crabs, more experienced crabs can. So they do develop abilities to assess shells in fights, so we're, we're not, and that's certain. And if you think about how they assess shells when they're moving their cheaty pets in particular ways and assessing the size of the shell, uh, but particularly with the chili pets, that, that can relate to the size of the shell that they require. But you get sex differences in the size of the chili pets, and that diverges as the crabs develop. And, and so the movements of a male chili ped will be less than that of a female chili ped for the same size shell, and yet they might require the same size shell. So that they, 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 they must recalibrate these assessment processes as they develop. Thanks very much. I'm sorry to have to cut off your individual question session, but there will, it will definitely come out again in the collective uh, session coming up after the, the next two speakers. If you thought that hermit crabs were smarter than you imagined, get set for Lars Chitka and his bees. Lars. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much. Can you all see my insects feel nothing slide now? You don't, you don't seem to be sharing. Um, okay, hang on. Uh, uh, Are they meant to be shown by you or by Laura? Hang on a sec. Now we should be getting somewhere. Yes, that's it. Very good. So the traditional idea of what insects feel or don't feel is I think well captured in this quote from Nobel laureate Calvin Frisch who famously um, discovered the bee dance language. He said, a bee sits at the feeder and abides sugar water. You cut off her abdomen at the thin wasteland with scissors. Her head and thorax stay in place and the meal proceeds, only that everything leaks out at the back. And then later on, such behavior is incompatible with the perception of pain. 
This would simply not make sense in animals with a hard exoskeleton. In us, with our soft skin, pain is a life-saving warning sign that ensures that we duly avoid injury. Now that view, I have to report, is still shared by the vast majority of um, the insect um, science community, um, to the extent that they haven't been invited by Stephen, but um, most okay. Drosophila workers uh, would still subscribe to that. It's, um, it's almost certainly nonsense. Um, so what Calvin Fish denies here is even the presence of basic nociception um, the reflex-like withdrawal from harmful stimuli and insects certainly have that. If anyone having witnessed, say, a grasshopper being impaled on a fishing hook um, will, will certainly testify that they will struggle with um, all the overt uh, routines that a human being might when they're subjected to the same sort of treatment. Um, but this, um, this um, view persists, um, and it's also, I guess, uh, well, um, um, characterized in the availability of live cockroaches with electrophysiology kits that kid, kits that um, parents or teachers can buy for their kids. So in this, uh, this website cheerfully announces that we're excited to announce the world's first commercially available cyborg. With our Roboroach, you can briefly wirelessly control the left-right movement of a cockroach by microstimulation of the internal nerves. The Roborod is a great way to learn about neural microstimulation, learning and electronics. So you can just do this at home. Um, and the reason is, of course, that as I guess, as Jonathan might have pointed out, um, has pointed out that um, there is currently no legal protection of any kind um, of things that can be done by people to insects. And so I'll, I'll um, build my case around bees, where I think the evidence is mixed, but getting more and more in the direction that I think we, we at least uh, need to scratch our heads a little bit um, about the possibility of sentience. Now, we've learned for over a century, we, we've known for over a century, and Calvin Fish was certainly uh, aware of that, that bees are not stupid. They can learn all kinds of things. Um, they have, of course, a home, a hive to which they must return from excursions many kilometers long um, and meant that might take them many um, several hours and of course um, they have to reliably find their way back to the hive because if they don't they did and they don't contribute their foraging efforts to their hive so there's strong selection for having really good spatial memory in addition of course bees have to be careful shoppers in the flower supermarket so they must remember the flower shapes and colors and scents that um, lead them to the best flowers. It's interesting in this regard that certainly whatever subjective world the bees have, it's certainly going to be very different from that of humans because they, for example, perceive colors in very different manners by including the ultraviolet in the spectrum. So what looks like a simple one colored flower to us looks very different to the bee as shown by this uh, image here in the, in the ultraviolet. But that in itself is no evidence for sentience. Now, where we're getting a bit closer is problem solving in solutions where um, which bees don't naturally encounter. So here's a string pulling puzzle where the bee pulls out a, an artificial flower from underneath a, gl a glass screen. Um, in the bottom panel, the bee has to roll a ball for reward so they can use a simple tool use uh, to obtain rewards. And as you can see on the right, they can also learn such techniques from each other and then almost collaborate um, in, in solving them. So in this case, the bees pull out multiple flowers jointly from underneath a glass table. Now, again, this form of intelligent behavior or problem solving could go without being sentient, sentient without having any kinds of feelings. Um, but I think it's interesting that some learning experiments, I think, have an indication that already goes in the right direction. So in this experiment, we've asked whether bees can imagine things or shapes. And the, the, the nature of the experiment, the bees had to learn to discriminate the shape of a ball from a cube um, while they could see them but not touch them. So they're covered with a plexiglass lid here. And bees, in this case, were rewarded on the ball. We subsequently presented the same bees with the same flowers in total darkness. 
And the bees were asked spontaneously, would the ones trained to be rewarded on balls um, recognize balls? Now they could touch them, but they couldn't see them because it's completely dark. And indeed they did. So the bees must have had some sort of internal representation of shape that was accessible from two different sensory modalities in this case. If you do the reverse, um, that also works. Um, so in this case, we train the bees in the dark to feel the shapes without seeing them and then ask them um, whether they would recognize the same shapes spontaneously without further training in light. And that they also succeeded with. So there's some sort of internal representation of things in the outside world, not simple associative learning. Associative learning in itself can function very well without consciousness or sentience. Now, are bees really the kinds of um, zombies that um, Calvin Fresh described them um, um, as? So it's very hard for me to imagine that a situation as is shown in this image here um, leaves a bee entirely cold, so to speak. So we, we observe, observe, of course, some struggle there. The bee tries to get away from the threat and might attempt to sting the spider and so on. But in the traditional Cartesian view, I suppose, or von Frisch type of view, is that all of these uh, behaviors are simply reflex-like. Um, that they have, that there's no internal um, sensation of there being a threat, that there is no um, picturing of the potentially disastrous scenario that's about to materialize in this situation. We tested something along those lines 15 years ago in an experiment with Tomings. Uh, one of the many things that bees have to do while flower foraging is to watch out for predation threat because they're chameleon-like spiders, crab spiders, that, um, that hunt on flowers and they're often very hard to see. We took this situation into the laboratory to see how bees might learn to avoid them. So what you're about to see is a bee captured by a robotic crab spider. And before you get too scared, it doesn't get harmed. These are very soft sponge pads that you will be seeing. But um, here goes the bee. She's visiting um, a flower that is safe. And now she's visiting one that she shouldn't have because there's actually a crab spider on it. You can certainly see that the bee is very annoyed, but it didn't get harmed in this. Now, the interesting thing is that the bees don't subsequently abandon the flowers altogether because they still need to feed. They don't abandon them in nature either. But what they do is that their whole behavior changes, and not just in the short term, but for several days. So they, they very carefully scan every flower before they land on it um, until they've ascertained that it's safe. But moreover, they're actually starting to um, see ghosts, that is, sometimes after scanning, they abandon perfectly safe artificial flowers um, without uh, landing on them. Um, so that indicated to us that there is much more than a simple reflex-like response, um, but um, on a psychological level, at least, there were interesting behavior changes that indicated that there is something going on in the mind of the bee rather than just um, uh, an anti, um, a hardwired anti-predator behavior. Now you can explore this question further by borrowing behavior par paradigms to diagnose emotions in large-brained vertebrates. And that's what we've done here. We've now switched to a study on positive emotions because we don't want to harm our bees any more than is, is necessary to acquire the, the necessary information. So in this task, we're basically asking bees, is your glass half full or half empty? Um, and um, we, we're doing that by training them first that um, blue on the left in this flat arena is rewarding and green on the right is not. And then we're presenting various intermediate options to see how they would respond to these, um, these uh, physically intermediate situations, such as a glass that's filled to the midline. And what you see after training is bees um, fly very, in a very rapid manner to stimuli that they know is rewarding and very slowly only they are um, in accepting the option that they know is unrewarding. Now, what do they do with ambiguous stimuli? So that's our glass here that's uh, filled to the midline. And interestingly, it turns out that what they, how, they, how they respond to such intermediate stimuli 
depends on what happened immediately before they entered the setup. If the bees are given a droplet, a surprise droplet of sugar solution before they're even starting, they're accepting this intermediate option much more readily than they do if they have not received this control droplet. So they're behaving as if they were, they were more optimistic in terms of when encountering these um, intermediate stimuli. So by the same criteria that a positive emotion-like state would be diagnosed in a dog or cow or goat, the bees also qualify. That's no formal demonstration of sentience, but at least it's as formal a demonstration as one would accept in a large brain vertebrate. So to briefly sum that up, so we know for, for sure that bees have a very rich, um, perhaps also other insects, library of memories, which they can flexibly access. There is a form of inner representation of things and, and possibly a mental exploration of possible problem solving solutions. Um, and then there are at least by the same criteria that are used in other um, large brained animals, some sort of emotion like states. And I think that has, of course, potentially at least a wide um, range of ethical considerations. Um, if you think about conservation, um, but also how we treat these animals in the laboratory. So millions and millions of insects are sacrificed on a weekly basis in fruit fly, fly laboratories, sometimes subjected to invasive um, um, treatments with electrophysiology without any kind of um, legislation requiring anesthesia or analgesics or, or anything of sorts. Um, do I have one more minute? Since no one said no, just yes, to... yes, definitely. Sorry, it took me a while to get to the button. Okay, all right. Um, if if you uh, are interested in this sort of topic, I urge you all to read the works of um, Charles Turner, who was a remarkable man, um, active over a century ago, um, who was one of the the early founding fathers of animal behavior, um, and was very interested in um, insect psychology and including the idea that they might have emotions. And he writes extremely well. He was um, largely forgotten until recently for, because of his ethnicity and also never managed to secure um, a permanent job at a research university. So much of his work was done while being a high school teacher. And he says this uh, when observing these Amorphila wasps, the coil antenna, the protruding mouth parts and the general attitude indicate intense excitement. One who believes that insects have emotions will find much in the attitude of these two amorphilas to support his view. All right, um, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the first question is from Robert Anderson. Some people associate the Cambrian explosion with the development of complex eyes. Is sentience necessitated by apprehending an external world as opposed to reaction to somatic senses? It's a good question and, and indeed one that has been expressed uh, by a number of people in, in recent years. So I think one, one thing that you need to do once you're an animal that moves and that senses its environment is to, to disentangle change in the environment as a result of an actual change that, that physically occurs. Um, from, from perceived changes in the environment that happen because you have moved in it. So if I tilt my head to one side for 45 by 45 degrees, then of course the entire image changes, but the perceived change is undramatic because I've done it intentionally and I know this change is about to materialize. If my environment suddenly tilts by 45 degrees without me doing that, I'm in the middle of an earthquake and I better run. Um, so disentangling self-generated um, sensory input or changes in the environment from an actual environmental change is a necessity for any moving animal with sensors. And some people have recently claimed that that might be a route for, for consciousness. Um, now you could implement um, such a subtraction of um, self-generated change, input change from external input change by, by um, mechanisms without consciousness or sentience, um, mechanistically that's possible, but it's equally plausible that, um, as you suggest, this might be at the roots of, um, might, might be linked to consciousness. Carlos Roa asked, 
the sentients always apply to each individual insect or can it apply to the whole colony? That's an interesting question. I think I've heard various um, ideas that there might be a kind of um, often expressed in whispering tones that there is a kind of uh, social conscience in um, bees and other social insects. I don't personally think so. There is very impressive swarm cooperative behavior in bees and collective decision making in honeybee swarms and so on. But if you ask the question of um, of decision making and cognition and in fact sentience in that context, it's still the individual that makes decisions according to information that it perceive that it receives from the environment. It's still um, if there is sentience involved in swarming, for example, interestingly, over a hundred years ago, Butler Reapen um, uh, thought that the swarming process in bees might be linked to some sort of emotional states, a kind of state of emotion that is actually not found in, in humans. But in, in that swarm, even if it behaves to us um, like a, a, a decision-making being, there are still as many minds in that swarm as there are individuals with individual perceptions and so on. So like in a human group, you can act together and achieve remarkable things together, but there's still as many subjective experiences as there are individuals in that group. I think the more likely candidate uh, for this kind of spreading effect is contagion rather than, than, uh, than sentience. And certainly in vertebrate cases, that's the explanation people prefer. Now there's a question here, is there any evidence for sentience in insect larvae? I don't know is the honest answer. So again, larvae can certainly um, learn. There's plenty of work with um, associative learning in fruit fly larvae and so on. Um, I mean, the evidence, so I mean, even in bees, I would say the, the evidence is fragmentary and only um, usable by common sense and analogy with, with other animals. So the kind of um, explorations of emotion-like states, for example, do not, to my knowledge, exist in insect larvae. So the science isn't there. We haven't done it yet, um, but it's, it's eminently plausible at least. Uh, Michael Broadhead on that same issue asked, do you study bees at early stages, like larval stages? We, we have not studied their, their larval learning, um, but others have done that. So in this context, for example, it's interesting that Martin Lindauer, uh, my scientific grandfather and a student of von Frisch, did uh, explore a tradition-like phenomenon in honeybees where um, where he um, trained bees to forage at certain adult bees at, to forage at certain times of the day, and the larvae that were um, that were raised in, in in colonies with these induced time preferences were then removed from the hive, and um, and and raised in a in a, in a climatized um, artificial setting, then put into a new colony. And these larvae that had been exposed to, let's say, early morning forages or late evening forages um, in the larval stage, subsequently when they um, came out of the pupa, had the same temporary preference. So they clearly learned from um, perhaps vibrations in the comb at the time, uh, at what time to forage. There is larval learning, it seems, that can be um, transferred that, 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 that still materializes in the adult, which is quite remarkable given that the entire nervous system re reorganizes during pupation. Um, but whether that qualifies as a sentience, possibly not. It might involve sentience, but we haven't um, looked at that aspect yet. Uh, we have a few more questions. They're all very good, but we're going to run out of time in this session. Do you think it would be, uh, Maisie Tomlinson asked, do you think it would be possible for a species to have reasonably complex cognitive abilities with some degree of awareness, but not to experience pain, pleasure, or positive or negative feelings. This is really about the primacy of valence. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I think we have to be open to such possibilities. So um, I don't see a formal reason why an animal, for example, that is intelligent um, automatically has to have a, 
the perception of pain or and or the capacity to suffer. So one cannot be in, deduced from the other. And we can certainly, um, I guess, leverage the learning ability to explore whether whether bees uh, remember foraging scenarios that were to them painful or rewarding and so on. Um, but I don't think the one necessarily follows from the other. They could, in theory, at least be disentangled. I thank you. I think this last this question will have to be the last one for now for you. Uh, it's from Lisa Levine, but let me pre preface it by the fact that there are some very noxious vertebrate experiments that have been done along these lines. You may about know, know about them, but now she's quest asking the question about invertebrates. Would you consider it a reasonable possibility that a bee living in an apiary that is traumatized by witnessing the death of a conspecific during fr uh, frame removal might resist remaining in that hive? I don't know. Um, again, is um, I mean there are certainly differences in how bees respond to an injured um, conspecific in the hive and outside the hive, and that outside the hive they largely ignore that the stimulus emanating from injured workers altogether. Whereas inside the hive, of course, um, an injured worker releases an alarm pheromone. Um, or presumably a one that's squashed to death as well, that induces other bees to become aggressive and sting. And there are certainly very suggestive, um, um, there's evidence that there is uh, a kind of subjective perception of risk and pain and so on involved in these attacks. But whether there is an, uh, a kind of uh, traumatized state, we don't know. And I suspect that they will not um, abandon their hive because they're very, um, very, very loyal to, to their mother colony. So I think that that will not happen. Thank you very much, uh, Lars, but stay around for the next okay. day. Yep, of course. Uh, we, we now uh, move to Helen, who is, um, she, she actually has a, a sentience as part of her as part of her uh, job description in some ways. She's concerned mostly with welfare aspects of all of this, and she's done reviews of it. And I now pass it to Helen Lambert. Hello, everybody. I am thrilled to be here and have this opportunity to talk to you about insect sentience, specifically in regards to their increasing use in insect farming. So the work I'm going to talk to you today about was performed by my firm, Animal Welfare Consultancy, and co-authored by the Global Animal Welfare Charity, World Animal Protection. So globally- uh, Helen, Helen, could you yes. raise your uh, sound volume a little bit or come a little closer to your speaker because your voice is trailing. Sure. Now I'll move my mic perhaps and uh, hopefully that's not blocking. I can't do my video, but hopefully that's okay. Uh, is that better? Yes, thank you. Right, okay. So globally, there is increasing pressure to find solutions for feeding the growing human population. One of the proposed answers to this problem is to farm edible insects, both for human consumption and as feed for domesticated livestock. And international policy bodies like the Food and Agriculture Organization for the United Nations are pushing this globally. In 2013, the FAO published this report here, Edible Insects, Future Prospects for Food and Feed Security. Since this was published, there have been numerous conferences held, new scientific journals created, many articles have been published discussing and proposing ways to develop this industry. And of course, numerous enterprises focused on farming and utilizing edible insects have also been developed. Edible insects are now also increasingly becoming a part of the pet food trade, beyond the exotic pet feed that you might be familiar with, and now more into the mainstream realms of dog and cat food. Eating insects is not the latest fleeting fashion. It is poised to become a booming and stable modern industry. But at what cost? What are we blindly running into? What do we know about the mental lives of these insects? And should we be considering their welfare now before it's too late? So in our review, we sought to find out more about the minds of insects what they can feel and what they can think in order to determine whether or not they're just machines or whether their feelings matter. 
And this is particularly important in light of their role as the answer to food and feed security and the emergence of more and more farms around the world that are breeding, rearing and slaughtering these mini livestock. So we performed a review of the scientific literature published over the past 31 years to find evidence of insect sentience. In particular, we used 167 keywords as an all encompassing definition of animal sentience. And we looked for studies that were either exploring whether insects were sentient or had already accepted a characteristic or trait of sentience in an insect species. We then did the same for cognition, this time using just 26 keywords. We included cognition in the review because we wanted to determine what is known about the minds of insects. So little is known about animal sentience in general, not just for insects. So we felt that an understanding of the cognitive abilities of insects would help us to understand a little bit more about their subjective minds and to determine whether we need to review their role in feeding the planet. So what did we find? Well, if we start with what insects can feel, firstly, let me remind you, there are over 1 million recognized species of insects. Our review returned 523 species and subspecies. And so this is really just a drop in the ocean. Furthermore, most of those species I mentioned are being studied in terms of their cognitive abilities rather than their capacity to feel. And overall, there were very few studies looking at or even referring to sentience in insects. We did find, however, evidence that honeybees can be uh, sorry, pessimistic or optimistic. And this changes in a similar way as it does in humans. So it can be used to reliably test how a, a bee is feeling in response to a potentially aversive veterinary treatment, for example. Carpenter ants were featured in a lot of the review papers. And in terms of sentience, they were assumed to be capable of affective states and emotions in several papers. In one study, their capacity to feel both positive and negative emotions was used to test the role of personality upon how they judge different stimuli. In the last picture here on the right, the Texas field cricket, researchers found that they are capable of experiencing chronic stress. This has really important implications for this species as they are one of the most popular edible species. We also looked at insect cognition. And as I've already mentioned, we had far more results for cognitive traits and abilities in insects. As you can see from this word cloud, the keyword learning returned the most results and it was followed by memory, recognition and cognition. There was overall far more evidence of cognition in insects. And so this serves as a useful starting point for thinking about their welfare. Now, of course, insects don't have to be smart to suffer but the range of cognitive abilities and the range of species featured in the review do highlight the fact that there is more to insects than we often think. If they're capable of all of this, what else are they capable of in terms of suffering or pain, or even in terms of positive emotions and states such as pleasure, play and joy? So what does this all mean for their role in farming? As I've already said, the industry is set to be enormous. It is growing at such a rate around the world. Many of you may not be comfortable with the thought of eating insects, but it is happening and we are being pushed and marketed to, uh, to be eating insects in our future. It's already becoming more mainstream. As I said, it's featuring in pet food and even you can go to the supermarket and buy cricket flour nowadays. The European Union now allows insects as feed for livestock. So anything is really possible on this scale. Now let's not forget, of course, even on a small scale, you are talking about potentially millions of individual animals in one small farm alone at any one point in time. So we need to know more about what these mini livestock are feeling. We need to know whether we need to create stringent welfare practices, whether we need to govern slaughter and include them into legislation. So much more needs to be done. But where do we start? Well, again, considering there are over 1 million recognized insect species, getting a grasp on whether or not they can all suffer is going to take some work, especially when we consider how diverse insects really are. The focus should therefore be on the species that are already being farmed on a global scale and those that are being promoted by the FAO for production. Despite the fact there are actually 2,111 species of edible insects, there are actually far fewer 
insect species that are being heralded as a solution to feeding the world. And of course, they should deserve our attention first. To narrow the scope a bit, we reviewed reports published by the FAO between 2013 and 2020, following the publication of the Edible Insects Report by the FAO. And we did this to identify the insect species that are currently being promoted in policy for farming and the reasons why edible insects are now on the global policy agenda. So we found that the FAO and others in policy were promoting crickets, ants, and palm weevils for human consumption. And black soldier fly, locusts, and crickets, again, for livestock feed. Now, the main reasons for promoting insect farming were to protect livelihoods, to boost the economy, for food security, and for sustainability. Other reasons included nutrition, environmental reasons, safety, efficiency, and human health. With this information, we can begin to think tactically about where to start focusing our efforts and of course our resources. And of course, we have lots more questions to answer. So for example, how do you humanely slaughter a cricket? Currently, farmers are using their best judgment to determine the most humane method to slaughter crickets. There isn't any scientific support for these methods. And some of the methods used, such as boiling, are deemed inhumane for other invertebrate species. The industry is steaming ahead though with these questions unanswered, as it's been assumed that insects cannot feel and so their welfare doesn't matter. Questions such as best slaughter practices, best housing conditions, and how to monitor and address health and disease issues need to be addressed from the insect's perspective, not just from best guesses, but from empirical evidence. So in conclusion, our review shows that there is more to these animals that is often, that is, than is often thought to be the case. Although the review of insect sentience did not return masses of evidence, this does not mean that insects are not sentient. It only highlights the need for more work to be done. None of the papers we found um, showed a lack of sentience in the insect. And so what little has been done is very promising. There just simply isn't enough being done so far. This isn't surprising. Sentience is a very hard subject to tackle. It's still very much in its infancy. Furthermore, up until now, there's not been urgency to focus on insect sentience. The attention has been on vertebrate livestock and animals used in experimentation. Rightly so, we farm and slaughter vertebrates in their billions too. Now though, insects are set to be the answer to food and feed security. So it's time we focus our efforts on their needs. Their fate is to be farmed in numbers far outweighing any vertebrate. And so their welfare deserves our attention. And so we are saying, rather than enter this new industry underprepared, we recommend that the sector allocates time and funding on researching humane and sustainable methods of farming insects to ensure that their welfare can be considered and protected. So I'd like to thank you very much for listening. I've put the reference to the paper that we published last month, if anyone would like to look at it in more detail. Otherwise, I'll open for questions. Thank you, Helen. This, um, the questions, your talk predictably precipitated uh, another aspect of the, of the problem. And so uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna temper the questions because it, it, it went so strongly over into the ethical and moral questions that I want to still keep a, a, um, a scientific spin on it, okay? Um, one of the things, um, uh, this is question. I mean, this is a altered question from Krishnamurti Mariyappan. Okay, the the gist of the question is con contained in what I'm going to say. Um, how come, if insects are sentient and can feel pain and can share food and search for food and find a mate, how come they're cannibals <laughs> right <laughs> well um you could throw that back to why do we humans do various things why can humans be cannibals i mean you know it's um that's that's exactly the question that's the re reply was expecting of course for this yeah i mean that's that's putting it into um that's giving sort of beyond sentient thinking about um, theory of mind, thinking about someone, another being, and then their their experience in relation to your own. So that's sort of going even sort of further beyond sentience, I would say. Um, I don't have to. I mean, 
it doesn't mean I'm not sentient if I treat someone cruelly. I know they may be feeling pain for my, my words, for example, it doesn't mean I'm, I um, stop myself doing that. So it shouldn't, I wouldn't have said that would affect um, the uh, implication upon their sentience. But yeah, I mean, in answer to your ethical bit of it, I realize um, this is going to spark a lot of people saying, oh, you know, we should just be eating plants and, and things. I'm not denying that. I'm just saying this is what's happening with policy. This is this is where they're pushing us. This is um, what they you know want um, to be the answer to food and feed security. Whether that's right or wrong is not what I'm here to say. Um, but it's happening, and we need to think about what it means in terms of the welfare of those animals that are involved. Thank you. There's another question that is, as we speak, is being answered by Irina Mikhailovich in her own way. But let me say to you as well: Would insect farm, in fact? to anybody who knows about the ecological aspects here, would insect farming on a large scale not disturb the ecosystem and food webs? Yes, yeah, so it um, has huge ramifications for um, the environment and of other species because you insects can obviously escape and um, it suddenly become invasive species if they are being reared in uh, countries or areas where they are not meant to be. Then when we think about genetically modifying some of these species, that's going to cause huge disruption. So absolutely, there are huge implications for this and how that may affect the food web, um, but also particularly affect directly affect pop other populations and so on, because you're introducing very modified um, beings into the wild. I mean, inadvertently, it's not going to be intentional, but no matter how strict your practices may be and how um, locked down you think, uh, your farm may be, some individuals are going to get out. Jackie Bob Black is raising the question that was entirely predictable and entirely appropriate. And she calls it a, a, a opening a can of worms as with an intentional pun. She says, the farming of insects, haven't we caused enough zoonotic diseases with farming the ones we already consider meat? Absolutely, and I think it's, this is the, my concern is that steaming ahead with these things, and there are so many, it's just another question to address. And as things develop, as we, uh, I say we, as they breed um, new speed, new, uh, new variations of, of insects and so on, what is gonna happen in regards to that? We couldn't predict um, the future in terms of what we've done with vertebrate livestock and the diseases that come out, not on such a specific level. And look what's happened there. So absolutely, it's a huge risk. Um, whether it could be justifiable because uh, it's less likely to be a risk to us, I don't know, because of invertebrates, it's not my speciality compared with vertebrates in terms of disease transmission, but certainly it's just another question that's not answered yet. Yeah. There are many uh, questions being raised in your, in your section. They'll come up again in the general discussion. Let me just say, uh, give you a couple more of them before we move on to the general discussion. Um, how might pain and poor welfare be affecting results on invertebrate research itself? Absolutely. So we know that with, uh, with any um, research, pain and emotional states and environment, um, mood, all of these factors could affect research. Um, and also it can affect it in a positive way or in a, a negative way. And that's often used as a justification for keeping experimental animals in sort of stripped down or barren um, enclosures and cages and in sort of social isolation. But also causing poor welfare by isolating individuals is known to negatively affect research as well. So certainly um, those are all factors that have to be considered when you're designing an experiment. Okay, here is a, a trickier one. It affects many people uh, in the panel. And uh, I don't know any, if anyone has a solution in general, but it's about the burden of proof and the null hypothesis. It's related to the, it's related to the um, precautionary principle. Why is the burden on insects or any other non-human animal to essentially prove their own sentience rather than being assumed until proved otherwise. Absolutely. I think when you're addressing insects and perhaps some of the other taxa, such as fish, you, it comes with it, this perception um, that they're sort of put in a separate box. I mean, if you think of the ramifications for finding out mosquitoes or, um, you know, uh, 
midges were, were sentient, what that would mean on a day-to-day -day le level for you know everybody in society is quite a big ask to sort of to um, acknowledge that in your everyday practices. Just walking down the street or driving in the car would be an act of mass murder of sentient beings just without intending to. So <clears throat> it has it's very difficult to um, accept that. And bear in mind, insects look so different to us. It's very hard to relate to them. Not only are they very physically different, um, they're much uh, in so many ways they are they are different to us, and so it's harder for us to relate to that. Thank you very much. Uh, one last uh, entry, which will be actually response from Robert Anderson, who could just as well have been on the panel um, concerning cannibalism. He says, uh, elevate that question to orcas, killing marine mammals. Orcas have cu cultures which potentially include moral concepts. Can killing for survival be evil? Yeah. And we should be asking ourselves as well as other species. Uh, with that, let me, um, let me uh, start the general question session with, uh, to start starting with Robert who has his ha hand held. Go ahead and speak, uh, Robert, and turn on your face if you can. Or Laura, can you turn on? I, I, I apologize, <laughs> just demonstrating my inability to operate controls of Zoom. I, I didn't mean to raise oh, you didn't mean to. Oh, OK, sorry. I was um, click, clicking something down there. <laughs> Lars, you have, seem to have your hand up at one point, too. Was that a mistake? You need to turn on your sound, Lars. Um, if so, that, uh, that would have been a mistake. So I, I, have, I, I have yet to think about a clever question. Um, okay. You don't have to have a qu clever question. You can answer the other ones as well. <laughs> All right. I, I, I have many here and, and I can uh, start raising them. They're, they're now addressed to anybody, any one of you. Uh, just a second, I have to go back to my list. Let me go high, higher up to, to when we were talking about uh, Yes, back to the precautionary principle. Um, can you discuss the implications of rethinking the use of invertebrates as food sources on the question of cultural differences? Anyone? Should I spell this out more? Uh, there are cultural traditions that would consider it presumptuous of us to be questioning uh, anything in this sphere because they've been doing it for thousands and thousands of years. Is that a reasonable stance? Well, yes and no. I mean, you could, you have the same challenge, I guess, with vertebrates, where I guess in certain parts of the world, um, people eat dogs, for example, or um, or brains of live monkeys and so on. And I think it's um, it's acceptable, I guess, where it's done and has been done. And the same, of course, applies to insects, where um, like in Mexico, for example, it's uh, insects have been in on the um, on the dinner table for for many centuries and possibly millennia. But um, for in, in both of these cases, I guess there is a perhaps a convenient um, denial of the fact that there is any kind of um, ethical concern. And in both of these cases, as scientific evidence grows, that might have to be reevaluated. So I think in the same way as um, I guess in parts of China, the the uh, tradition of um, catching and uh, dogs and uh, and stripping them of their fur alive and so on is currently being is under attack and therefore being reconsidered, um, because I guess um, outside in in other parts of the world, I think the acceptance of the idea that there is a very real evidence for suffering is is fairly solid. And in the same way, I think that applies to 
um, places where where I think insects are being used for food. Jonathan, why are you so coy? This is in your bailiwick. Cultural versus cultural differences. I would like to see more use of democratic processes for resolving these conflicts of value when they occur, as, as they undoubtedly do in some cases. In the UK, last year we had something called the Climate Assembly, which was a citizens assembly that was trying to come up with proposals for how to reach carbon neutrality by sort of thrashing out all of the trade-offs in a democratic way. And I think that's a, an excellent idea and we should do the same kind of thing for animal welfare too. Um, I don't think that our own opinions as individuals about how society should reconcile its conflicts um, will change things by themselves. But what could really change things is democratic process that really puts people in a position to think through these issues and face these questions of, well, could these cultural practices that involve causing lots of animal suffering, like dropping lobsters into boiling water, could they actually be reformed in relatively straightforward ways while retaining the value of the cultural practice? People need to be discussing these things. And it's through discussion that we'll get progress. Uh, can I ask our other philosopher who's in the background, Ira, if, you're, if your maternal duties are not keeping you, whether you have a view on this? Irina Mikhailevich, are you there? Yes. All right. <laughs> um, I, yeah, my maternal duties are at the moment um, <laughs> calling me, so I apologize. I will be back as soon as uh, I have That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> so sorry. Let me, let me um, strengthen it because um, Jonathan um, l l wriggled out of the question by, by uh, genuflecting to democracy. How deeply that's would you like to out of the question? That's that's <laughs> that's how we should answer these questions. Well, well, yes. I, I, I would be careful there with with unfiltered democracy. I think if you would um, run the views that people in this panel hold by the general population, they will very likely lock us up in a lunatic asylum. I think there is very little current acceptance that insects are anything but a nuisance. People are just so, some people coming around to the view that at least the, the, the bees among the insects are just so useful, but everything else is a use, is a nuisance and needs to be sprayed off the wall. I'm not, I'm not sure that's um, true of insects, but I really doubt it's true of uh, decapod crustaceans. One of the other submissions to the EFRA inquiry that I spoke to and mentioned earlier was from an organization called Rethink Priorities that did a survey of people's attitudes towards decapod crustaceans. And uh, I think, from what I remember, I think a majority of people were entirely on board with the idea that they have feelings and, and matter. Um, so sometimes we underestimate people. Or Jennifer, sometimes we're, we're just lucky with people's opinions, but, um, but if you put it to um, even simple choices of um, vegetarianism versus versus um, meat eaten amongst humans. I think the us vegetarians or vegans are in a in a very very tiny minority still, and so there's a um, there's a lot of um, room for improvement there, and and um, and that won't just um, be decided by a majority vote. I think because by by that principle the vast majority of people will continue to eat meat. So I think we need to, to still work on generating acceptance for that. And that won't just work with um, throwing the vote out to the majority, I think. Jennifer, I've been a critic of subsidies Sorry. for the meat industry. Yeah. Um, yeah, Jennifer. It, it's, it's tricky to orchestrate this. Jennifer's had her hand up for a while if she meant to put it up. Jennifer? Yes, I did mean to put it up. Um, Go ahead. We're, we're mixing up two different things here. We're mixing up how do we feel about animals that eat the same species versus how do we feel about the species that we eat? And if you look at how we feel about the species that we eat, it's completely cultural. 
It's just simply a tradition. On the other hand, I thought that was a fascinating question. Should we be sympathetic with animals that aren't sympathetic to their conspecifics? Because octopuses do cannibalize one another. And that doesn't stop me being sympathetic to their welfare. And the same, same point was made about orcas. Who, whom people care about in aquarium uh, captivity, but who are not that merciful. Ira, does this mean you're ready to join? Um, it depends moment to moment, that's, but- That's all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just wanted to, to add, um, I thought Jennifer, you might raise, you, you, you may have been about to raise the point about education, uh, moral education, as well as just education about the capacities of these animals. Uh, part of what uh, would make a democratic process work better, of course, is if the democratic, the partners to the democratic process were adequately informed on the empirics as well as um, perhaps on the ethics. So, I, I mean, I, th I think on the one hand, uh, democratic, sorry, <laughs> she has an opinion too. Um, and democratic process would probably in maybe in principle would be the way to go, but, or at least in practice, the way to go, but in principle the democratic process ought to be informed also by, uh, or conducted by uh, members of a better informed democracy. That's what I like about the citizens assembly idea that it involves getting together a panel of citizens and informing them about the issues. There had been a question for you earlier, uh, Jonathan, about what are the first steps to acknowledging the sentience of animals and putting legal pr protections in place? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, you could argue that the sentience bill is a first step of a kind. There already was in the EU's Lisbon Treaty a sort of first step in the form of this clause that says animals should be respected as sentient beings, but also that this should be weighed against religious, cultural practices, etc. It was never really clear what that clause really implied in practice or what it really committed people to. This sentience bill is an opportunity to do better than that, I think. It's an opportunity to create something with a bit more substance to it that will hopefully, if nothing else, create a mechanism for holding policymakers to account uh, in the UK if they fail to um, take appropriate account of animals as sentient beings. Now that's very much a, a first step, you know, in addition to the other well, animal welfare laws that that exist. But I do think it is a, a positive step and something that would be good to see, not just in the UK, but, but all around the world. Just this basic commitment in law, we will respect the interests of sentient animals. Uh, there was another, there's a related question for you from Shay about what countries already have regulations regarding the welfare of crabs and lobsters. Other, yeah, well, yeah. Th there are some uh, places in which extreme practices like live boiling are banned. Switzerland notably banned it recently, and I think parts of Italy, parts of Australia, New Zealand. So this issue is gaining some traction. And the UK, you know, we often talk about ourselves as having the strongest welfare protections in the world, but that's not the case when it comes to invertebrates. And that's definitely one area in which we should be looking to strengthen existing law if we aspire to have the best animal welfare laws in the world. There's another question here from Jerry Opperhauser, which has, is often raised in different contexts about sentients and it's addressed to anybody really, do or would animals have different levels of sentience based on their experience and sensory input? Or is sentience kind is of- that for me as, as well? I mean, I, I definitely mm -hmm. have a view on that that's set out in my paper, Dimensions of Animal Consciousness. I think we've got to be thinking of sentience as something that varies along many different dimensions. But Bob, you want to comment? Well, I was gonna say much the same thing, but, but... I, I, I personally believe it's it's very difficult. You, you can show that animals respond in ways that are consistent with pain, for example, um, but you don't really know what the pain is. You can, you, you, you can always liken it to our own pain. My pain is what I liken it to. I can't liken it to Jonathan's pain because it might be different to mine. And, and, and the idea that sort of an optimist might feel pain in one way and, and uh, a lobster might feel pain in a different way, 
which one is worse, I don't know. You, you might be able to work on that experimentally and ask, well, what will these animals give up um, to avoid a particular stimulus? Will, will, will some animals be quite accepting of, of what an animal escapes from in order to stay near a, an important resource? And I would tackle it in that in that way, in an experimental way. But but again, that is still fraught with difficulties. Now, although there are no embryologists on the panel, and Aaron Sloman, who asked this question for, uh, on YouTube, um, has a theory on this, and so I think it's a theory-driven question. Is there anyone that wants to take on this one? Could the processes that assemble a new animal inside an egg, producing a chick or a baby, or a uh, include pre-hatching sentience? And please, no, no right to lifers on this particular question. Yeah, go ahead, Rob. There will become a stage where certain things are possible in development. So that if an animal does become sentient, it, it presumably becomes sentient at some time. It, it will have experiences at some time that it couldn't have had at an earlier stage. And, and I think for a chicken and an egg, uh, if the adult is, is, is sentient, then, then that has to appear. And does it appear on hatching? I don't know. I doubt whether, whether it would appear specifically at hatching. Uh, these animals do communicate with each other within the egg or between eggs. They respond to external stimuli. We, 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 we would have to look at that. One, one, one could do that experimentally and start asking, what do these animals respond to within the egg? And are those responses merely reflexes or are they more than reflexes? Thank you. This question was for Jonathan, but in fact, it's addressed to everybody. Yeah. Sentience, sorry, were you going to say something about this one, uh, Lars? Oh, oh just, uh, I, I was just reminded of Reuven Dukas's talk in your conference a few years back, where he made exactly that case for human beings, where until a few decades ago, um, um, little male humans were circumcised, circumcised without any form of anesthesia because it was thought that um, all the crying and kicking that they do is simply reflexes and that there is no sentience. Um, and I guess that just illustrates the difficulty of diagnosing it even, even in larval human beings, so to speak. So we now know, for example, that um, human embryos can learn some aspects of their mother tongue because they show different responses to their own language that they've um, experienced in utero versus others. So there's clearly some learning that carries over into their past eclosion stage, if you wish to use um, insecty language, but whether that constitutes sentience is a, is a difficult question. And if it's difficult in humans, then that's all the more so in, in other animals, but it's eminently plausible that there is some sort of sentience, even if there is in humans, not a, a postpartum memory about it. Another very general one. What is the relation between these questions about presence, absence of sentience and presence, absence of cognitive abilities? You've met, several of you have mentioned it, but what is methodologically and logically the relation between these two questions? I think the relation is an evidential one, that cognitive abilities are an important source of evidence of sentience. That doesn't mean that there couldn't be sentience in animals that are very cognitively simple. It just means we might have to look at different, for different warning signs, different symptoms in those cases. But I think cognitive abilities can be a really useful way in. They can give us a window into sentience. And they often get more attention as well. So um, in terms of research, there's far more generally, not just with invertebrates, but there's far more research on cognition than there is specifically on sentience. Yeah, because we know how to look for these cognitive abilities in many cases. Okay. So it can be a great experimental strategy. A question for Bob. Has anyone tried to experimentally interfere with the shell assessment process through anesthetics so the crab can't feel size, shape, etc.? And if so, do they avoid changing shell if they're in a non-ideal shell when presented with one that suits them better? 
I don't know of any experiments on that. I certainly haven't performed any. Um, no, I, I don't think that that, 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 that is, but it, it, it might be a, a good way forward. But if, if you put an anesthetic, a local anesthetic on the limb, you, you may in fact immobilize the limb. I, I know people have done extreme experiments and many, many years ago of removing the major or minor claw and seeing how that would affect uh, the, the ability to assess shells. But it's not an experiment I would recommend in the present context. I personally like this question from Brenda Jagathizan. Do you think that hesitation to use what is typically feared to be anthropomorphic terms has halted or I should maybe halted is too strongly put, has, uh, has uh, constrained sentient uh, research, research attitude towards, I mean, how did she say it? Has halted sentient toward, sentient, I think she means has, has constrained sentient research and the, the implications for welfare of insects. Definitely. Don't want to sound anthropomorphic. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm always <laughs> talking about how we use very scientific terms when we're talking about sentience, but from a general public perspective, we need to be using terms that people are actually familiar with. So it's not necessarily being anthropomorphic if we've got the evidence to the animals experience um, those emotions or states or whatever, but it's far more useful, especially from a protection angle to talk about sentience in familiar terms, whether they may be seen as anthropomorphic by some, as long as we're cautious about how we use them and we've got evidence um, when we're, we're talking about that capacity in an animal, that's not being anthropomorphic, it's just using language that we can recognize. And I come from an animal protection organization background and even within charities, there's, there's caught up and tied up. So it's like, you know, I don't want to be anthropomorphic on one hand and then the next minute they've got, you know, bears doing whatever but <laughs> that's another story but you know we're very fearful of this when we're talking about sentence it's not always useful at all my fellow hungarian alexander borbe who's now in switzerland asks don't some religions assume sentience of all living organisms and prohibit killing them it could be a rather advanced view yeah, religion isn't always that straightforward, though, because uh, you often, you can, I mean, you just look at the whole religious slaughter debate and it gets very complicated. But, um, you know, halal methods and um, other methods are with the idea that the animal suffers and it's giving them the, um, the best death possible, but it doesn't actually necessarily on scientific welfare terms, uh, halal slaughter without stunning is not the best and most humane method of um, death slaughter for that animal. So although religions may sort of accept animal sentience, putting that into practice can actually be quite complicated. We're approaching the breathless period two minutes before closing. I have so many questions and so many good ones still here in the list. I'll of course save them for next week's uh, um, uh, episode, but I want to thank all the speakers and all of the questioners, including and commenters, including those whose comments we never got around to. It was a very rich session, and I think it bodes well for the next one. Thank you very much. If there, oh, by the way, if there are any cl closing remarks from anybody, we have two minutes for them. I think there was already a perfect I, ending, I, Stephen. We could only make it worse. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, and see you next week. All right. Thank you Good. very much, everybody. All right. Bye bye.